Greetings, everyone. This is Matthew Moretz, uh, vicar at St. Thomas Church, Fifth Avenue, and I'm so glad to join you today. Um, earlier today, there was a bit of a technical difficulty with the photos that I intended to show you for this class, the Treasures of St. Thomas Community in Stone. I figured out what went wrong, um, and now I'm going to seek to present what I presented this morning um, because some of the ways that I presented in the morning were scattered trying to figure out what to do. I'm going to try to you know, succinctly talk about what I had the chance to talk about this morning with you all, and uh, so for posterity. So let's begin. I want to talk to you about the ornamental facade of St. Thomas Church, and one of the things that I mentioned this morning is um, how delightful it's been to learn about the ornamental facade. Uh, I haven't really looked at it closely in the four years that I've been here. I had the occasion to look very closely at the Raridos with a set of about six or seven classes that we had together on the ornamental screen behind the altar, uh, carved beautifully by Lee Lowry, designed by Goodhue and uh, Styers, uh, our rector of the, at the time. And I've looked at the stained glass windows that we have, uh, many of them, not all of them, but many. And now, the, with the occasion to look carefully at the ornamental facade uh, of the church, is um, it's a wonderful way to think not only about what it says, but what it says alongside the other iconography that's inside the church. And I hope during the three sessions that we have together on the ornamental facade, I'll be able to bring out some of those dynamics and, um, you know, with great delight. You know, it's really wonderful. There's all kinds of Christian artistic um, presentations that where the iconography rhymes with itself. Maybe there's a diptych or a triptych where the, the pieces that are opposite one another um, are not there for no reason. They're rare for a reason, and they sometimes say something by that juxtaposition. Uh, so, and I think there's one juxtaposition that I'm very interested in showing you today, um, but we'll see if we get there. Now, since this was the problem before, I'm going to make sure that we, uh, you can see. All right. Here is the facade of St. Thomas Church. I'm going to test uh, the function here. Zooming in. Yes, I know. All these details that you see here, I hope to explore um, from the very top to the very bottom, at least on the Fifth Avenue side. And what I'd like to talk about most today is what's found inside the archway. Um, and it's very gloomy here, but it won't be for a variety of other photos. Let's go to the next one. All right, here, here is the general zone under the archway uh, that I'd like to look at. And we have a double portal here at St. Thomas Church. And one of the things that I delightfully discovered is that these statues, the statues that were that are here in all of these niches, um, and the carvings that are in the archway here, these were all carved in the 1960s. Uh, they were they, they were carved from 1962 through 1963. And um, so, but the carvings, they had to carve into things that were already there in the archway. And in the niches, they had to put in uh, statues that hadn't been there before. What's really cool is that there's a, um, a picture that Norman Rockwell uh, painted and I, of this ornamental facade of this archway. And um, every single one of the statues in his painting um, are white, are bright white, and the rest of the stone is gray and um, and, and rugged. Uh, the others are like ivory. And I always thought that was an odd choice, thinking that he done, made that into a choice, but I don't think that anymore. Because now that I've recognized that these uh, statues, look over here, here we have the statue in the center of St. Andrew. So that St. Andrew statue was carved in 1962 or just before. And so when it was uh, installed, there would have been contrast between the stone of the church and the stone of the newly installed statue. Um, every single one of the statues you see here would have been white in, in comparison, much lighter than the rest of the building. Um, this design of the facade was planned long before 1960. It was planned uh, at the beginning of the church's uh, construction in the 19 teens uh, and by Bertram Goodhue and in concert with. Um, the rector at the time, Father Styers, he had had a complete plan and design for the exterior work. Um, but I am told by my study that um, 
Oh, and it's important to read here. There's a plaque that indicates when it was made. The Scott Memorial completed A.D. 1963. The sculpture and carving on the facade made possible by a bequest under the will of George S. Scott is a memorial to him, his family, for many years, parishioners of St. Thomas Church. Now, it's a lovely, um, you know, carved plaque there. Um, there was, I found out looking up who George S. Scott was, um, there was a great um, legal kerfuffle over his bequest and as to whether, and you know, his family kind of disagreed that his bequest, that our interpretation of his bequest was correct. Um, did he mean for his bequest to be a pass-through gift through us to the adjacent St. Luke's Hospital, uh, which its tuberculosis unit had been around here. And it closed down from the time in between his uh, making a bequest to the church and his dying in the 60s, in, in 61 or 60. And uh, so when his bequest was given to us, there was great uh, among the family and others, some concern if, whether we were using it properly. It seems that the end result of the legal kerfuffle was that 70% of the bequest was set aside for St. Luke's Hospital, and the 30% uh, was set aside for things like this, uh, the ornamental facade, uh, and this, what this, the, as it is styled, the Scott Memorial. There is someone who, though, introduced his uh, influence into the iconographical screen, uh, scheme that we have here. Uh, in the 60s. This is uh, Canon West, uh, Canon Edward Nason West, um, and he was a, a towering figure in the New York City church, uh, Episcopal church life it, for, for a long time. He, he was um, named, he, he was a, he was named sacristist, sacrist at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, Canon sacrist in 1943, and he stayed involved in the life of the cathedral uh, for many, for decades, um, even though he retired in 1981, he um, still stay, stayed as MC until, and a part of the life of the parish until he died in 1990. Uh, he was well known for his understanding of ecclesiastical heraldry and Christian symbolism. This person designed the uh, seal of the Anglican Communion. Among many other things, he could write icons. He wrote a whole icon iconostasis for um, the Church of Saint Savas, in, um, in that was in New York City. Uh, it's since burned down. It burned down about ten years ago, tragically. Um, he wrote many books on Christian spirituality and Christian symbolism, and he was a big proponent of the Order of Saint John and made it possible for the Order of Saint John to be have a chapter here in the, the U.S. Priory. You can see his Order of St. John, uh, some of his um, medals there um, that represent his order and others. Um, he was a big part of welcoming uh, luminaries from across the world um, to New York City, uh, whether it was royalty or um, celebrities or cultural figures. And it seems that Canon West uh, was given the reins to adapt the iconographic screen the scheme of this uh, ornamental facade in the 60s. And I'm, I'm eager to find out what changes he might have made and, or what decisions he might have made that I don't know quite yet. The, car, the sculptor of this, um, this ornamental facade, the, the designer of this sculpture, you know, it would have been Canon West who would have taken good hue and Father Steyer's plans from the 19 teens adapted them and given them to Theodore Barbarossa, who was a famous sculptor um, from Boston. He um, was someone who did a lot of religious sculpture. He um, was educated in Boston and he had a lot of public sculptures as well. Um, he had two monumental figures in the 1939 World's Fair. He worked on the Cathedral of the Assumption in Baltimore. St. Mary's Seminary Chapel in Baltimore, St. Thomas, us, uh, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, a lot of the statues there are his, and National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. Um, he was lauded for his work. One of the things that he did, one of the pieces that he made was this. Um, uh, he made these eagles that were on a bridge, and that bridge was on a colonial, it was called the Colonial Road Bridge. It was completed in 1911. 
And this is where First Avenue crossed Shore Road in Brooklyn. Now this bridge doesn't exist anymore, um, but what they did do is they took these eagles and have them on display at the Central Park Zoo, which is delightful. My, my children, I've taken pictures with Sam in, in front of this um, eagle, and I had no idea that the same person who carved the statues on the ornamental facade of St. Thomas carved these eight eagles that are throughout the Central Park Zoo. It's really delightful. Um, he uh, lived, let's see, he lived until 1992. I was born in 1906, lived until 1992, and um, we're grateful for what he did. The style, here's an example of one of the details um, in the archway. Uh, this is the part one of the graces of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're going to look at all of them uh, in subsequent lectures, but this is one example. Um, tiny details that, not tiny, um, details that look tiny from a distance, but they're probably quite big. There's probably a foot or more in, uh, in height, and, uh, but it's meant to be viewed from afar, and this represents holy fear, and it's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit at confirmation, and it looks like a, either a, a deacon or a priest holding up his hands in the Oran's position, but it's actually not a priest. It's actually not a deacon. It's actually a seraph, a six-winged seraph two wings to cover up his eyes before the presence of the Lord, so he's not destroyed, uh, two wings to cover up his, uh, you know, his, to make sure he's not ashamed, you know, covering up his body, and then another, two others to fly with. In this case, they're covering up his feet. Um, it's, uh, and it's titled Holy Fear, and the angels in the Isaiah vision, they sing holy, holy, holy. And so it's a very kind of holy fear. It's, it's sort of pun, really. And uh, we'll look at all of these. Um, this is one example. The, um, you know, it's, it's got a, a little, uh, someone said today this morning, it looks cubist, like a Picasso or something in terms of the lines. I think the lines of what he does um, are, are, are different than the lines of statues that are used, utilized in the statues of the, um, the Raridos. Less realistic. Uh, more art deco-y, uh, more, uh, it's like someone is being, um, the lines are smoother and more, you know, it's like, it's like carving in cursive, you know, it's not, it's not one-to-one -one relationship to reality. See, look at this beard. The beard is very stylized. It's not like a, it's not pretending to be what a real, real beard looks like. Um, there's a stylized quality to all of the carvings that are in this ornamental facade. Um, and from the era of the 1960s. Let's see. Is there anything else I want? Oh, yes. So what I did get a chance to talk about um, in, the, in the lecture today, and I want to skip through these, is St. Thomas. All right. So this is very interesting. St. Thomas was one of the last statues to be installed. And, you know, it's, again, look, his beard is very stylized. The um, His robes are very... You know, not many folds. It's it's kind of a, you know, it's um, there's a stylization to it, and you know, one would be forgiven if they thought that this was uh, Jesus when they're walking in, but it's actually Saint Thomas, our patron saint. And what's important to know is that this comes from a very specific moment in uh, the Gospels. Um, you know, he's patron of our parish, but he's got downcast eyes and outspread palms. And, and this is the moment when he has just risen from his knees following the moment of his recognition of the risen Christ. So it's almost like he doesn't want to look up at Christ. He, he, all, he doesn't want, you have to imagine the scene that's portrayed in the uh, upper room, you know, statuary above our altar in the Raridos. In the Raridos, there's a scene with all the disciples and the risen Christ and St. Thomas is kneeling beneath Christ looking up at him saying, if you could imagine the scene, he would be saying, my Lord and my God. He has moved from doubt to uh, discovery, to recognition. He recognizes Jesus as the Christ um, in this upper room. And this is the moment where he gets up from his kneel, knelt position and starts to live his life anew. And his eyes are downcast, which is a very interesting choice. And um, and his his hands are very dynamic. They're doing things. They're outstretched. They're active in prayer, in blessing. It looks like he's about to, he's, he could be blessing um, the people, just about to lift up his hand in a blessing 
in a way. Um, and so we talked a little bit about this, uh, this statue here. It's the largest statue in the set. Um, here's another view of him here. You know, look closely at the detail. Really quite beautiful. There are his feet. So, um, you know, it's an extraordinary view of St. Thomas, and St. Thomas blesses us when, when we come in. But what I love is how St. Thomas is shown at the moment of his uh, new life in this door, um, and in the altar, he's shown at the very moment of his recognition as well. There are sequential images of St. Thomas in stone that we have here, and that are very pivotal places, one above the altar, St. Thomas recognizing Christ, and then right at the door, St. Thomas in his new life. It's almost like St. Thomas is leaving the church <laughs> to go out into the world as an apostle um, based upon what he discovered inside. Um, I think that's what's going on, um, or at least I think it would be a nice way to think about it. Um, these are all these, um, as you can see, these images that are above us in the uh, archways. Um, they're, thematically, they, they all orbit around the Holy Spirit. I'm going to go through this carefully next time. Go, and where, where did that Holy Fear uh, version go? Let's see. Oh, I can't see. I think it's, oh, it's over here. There it is. See that? There's Holy Fear again. And, uh, you know, the way I was showing it to you was upright. But when you would experience it, it would be, you know, like this uh, canister of, uh, you know, all these canisters that are going by. Um, all of these would have been carved, you know, far later than the church was built. And uh, so it probably wouldn't have been white because they were from the same stone that had always been. There. Um, we're going to look carefully next week at all of the figures here. Uh, many, many of the disciples that aren't featured um, in, in the larger images, uh, the ones that don't show up here are going to be up in here and we'll talk about that later and christ the king is up here and we're going to look at him soon but you can note that um look at him next time you can note that there's a net up so it's sometimes hard to make out what's going on here um or it, it creates a kind of haze with the net um but so so be it we really don't want it to be damaged by uh pigeons which is a real possibility um and we have to be very careful with this wonderful heritage that we have. So let's see. That was about as much as I could get through in our class um, this morning because of technical difficulties. But I'm very much looking forward to walking through even more of this ornamental facade so that we'll be able to know about it, appreciate it, and probably draw encouragement and uh, nourishment in our faith. All the very best and see you next week. Bye-bye.